Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with Grand Bay Westfield Mayor Brittany Merrifield. Nestled along River Valley Scenic Drive in southwestern New Brunswick, Grand Bay Westfield captivates with its diverse offering and natural charm. With close to 6,000 residents distributed across wards one and two, Grand Bay Westfield stands as a haven for those seeking a harmonious blend of outdoor adventures and community living. Explore a myriad of recreational possibilities from picturesque hiking and cycling trails to vibrant parks, a golf course, tennis courts, and even, yes, pickleball courts. Indulge in retail therapy and exquisite dining experiences, all within the welcoming embrace of a town celebrated as Neighbors by Nature. Grand Bay Westfield beckons as a place where everyone, old and new, can not only live and truly thrive, this scenic community along the River Valley Scenic Drive embodies the spirit of growth and unity. This is Cross Border Interviews with Mayor Brittany Merrifield. Brittany, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start, before we're talking about the community of Grand Bay Westfield, I want to get to know about the person behind the mayor's chair. And I want to start by asking the age-old question on the show, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Brittany? That came firmly from my upbringing. Um, it's sort of baked into everything that we've done as a family since I was a young child. My uh, my parents were always involved in boards, committees, politics, etc. So when they were doing that kind of thing, we were often brought along, and uh, that's I think where it came from. It was just in our blood due to the way we were brought up you, you say politics are you the first one to enter elected politics or had you had someone in the family that actually took the step before you did I actually had two members of my family that campaigned for provincial politics before I decided to take the step into the municipal realm. So my father and my sister both ran provincially one in 2014 and one in 2018. So what was your desire to get into municipal politics then? Because it sounds like your family is more provincially minded. So for you, where did that desire to get involved locally come from? You know, it's, it's that whole being at the real grassroots level of politics. You know, you know, ever since I made Grand Bay Westfield my home, I've been involved trying to make things better because I think that uh, everybody has an obligation, you know, to be involved to help make a change in their community and help make their community better any way that they can. So um, that is, to me, municipal is where the rubber hits the road. It's where you can make the changes that are effective almost immediately. So that really, that really resonates with me. What was it for you particularly? Because I tried to do a deep dive onto your electoral history and the only election that I can find that you ran in is in 2022 when you ran for mayor of your community and you get a claim. So is this the first time you get you put your name on the ballot in 2022 or had you considered it prior or had you put your name prior to that election? It was, uh, you know, it was uh, 2021, and oh. it was the first time my name ever appeared on a ballot anywhere, and I, it was kind of a big leap. I hadn't served on a council anywhere before. I served on committees of council, and I've uh, been involved on boards and committees and action groups, etc., over the years, but it is a much different thing to serve on a board and committee than it is to to put your name out there for elected office. Um, and I feel very, very privileged and very, very grateful that the community felt that I was the right person for the job at the time. So in 2021, it's because I read an interview with you with a radio station that you did at the time, and you said that you had people approach you in this interview, and I think it's with a KX, if I'm not mistaken, 96. Please correct me if I'm wrong here for those who are listening. Um, you, you talk about how people were approaching you to actually put your name forward. Um, what was going on in the community that people sort of were attracted to your sort of leadership style or your persona to say, 
Brittany, you should run. You should put your name on the ballot. Do you remember what was going on in the community during that time to say, to have people come up to you in that fashion? Yeah, I think there were a couple of um, sort of landmark moments that maybe made people think that I would be the right person for the job. Um, I was very involved in the recreation committee with our local community center at the time. And uh, with, uh, the, with the team that I was working with, we brought a lot of options to the kids, the youth and the adults in the community that, that weren't there before. Um, also in 2018 and 2019, we unfortunately had uh, two historic floods, you know, one right after the other. And uh, I was uh, lead of the volunteer efforts during those two spring, uh, spring freshets and coordinated volunteers in the filling and delivering of tens of thousands of sandbags to homes in danger of flooding. We had hundreds of volunteers come out and uh, um, it was it was quite it was quite an effort uh, from everybody, but uh, I was involved in coordinating that. So I think people understand that you know I'm results oriented, and that I have absolutely no problem rolling up my sleeves and getting the work done. Well, that that's a perfect segue into the role of a councillor slash mayor. Um, you, now you have a few years under your belt now, two years under your belt as mayor of your community. And I can imagine in those two years, you've been pressed with some pretty difficult choices and pretty difficult decisions that you have to make. And being on the other side of the table, being on a board and then being on council is two different things, as you've just alluded to. How important is it for you to be prepared to make a decision that is going to impact the people of your community the day after you make it? Because you are, like you said, where the rubber hits the road. You are in your community and you're making decisions that are going to affect your community the day after you make them. How hard has that been for you to adjust to? You know, it, it is it is tough, you know, because sometimes you're faced with decisions where there is no great answer uh, and that's hard. So I take my role as mayor very seriously. I, I feel that I have an obligation to be as prepared as I possibly can be. So to prepare, you know, with, you know, for a meeting, you know, meet with the CAO to discuss the agenda. I help develop the package Prior to the council meeting, I meet with the CAO to discuss the agenda items. It's, again, it's that obligation that I understand all of the content that's in the package and recommended recommendations by administration because of these decisions that we make that impact the entire community. And we have to look at it as, as the community as a whole. So sometimes you get in a situation where some people aren't going to like the decision that you've made and some people are going to be in favor of the decision. Say that's that not so, Mayor. You're <laughs> saying that 100% of the people don't agree with you? What? Come on! <laughs> I know, but uh, it, it, it does. So we have to we have to balance the what is the greater good with any of the decisions that we make. How hard is that, though? Because you... <clears throat> As mayor, you were the chair of the, uh, the council. You were one vote, and you know you were only one vote. So you have to, A, understand where the majority of your council are, are heading towards, but also understand where the community is going as well. How important is it to look at the greater good at every single issue when we all have unconscious biases within ourselves? We all believe there's there's a path forward, but you as mayor, as an elected official, have to balance the needs of your community with your own unconscious biases on certain issues. Yeah, that's tough. And you really <laughs> have to do work to recognize those unconscious biases. And I don't actually get a vote unless there's a tie. So... Um, and I haven't been in a situation where I've had to vote yet, but uh, I do have to be aware of where my council is on issues. But I, you know, I counsel, I counsel my council that um, you have to try and put any unconscious biases aside. You can't, without, especially without reading the package first, decide where you stand on an issue without knowing all of the information, without hearing all of the people that may be speaking um, during a presentation, without reading the recommendations from staff and any attendant information. That That isn't easy because, you know, we all say, well, I, you know, I don't like this or, or, or I like this, but 
really you, good decision making is based on the information available to you. And you do have to try and take any personal biases that you have and put them to the to the side. And that's not easy. I, I, I need to clarify something here for a second, because you just said something that is quite shocking. But you as mayor do not have a vote on your council unless there's a tie. Is that all of New Brunswick? That is all of New Brunswick. Okay, for anyone who's listening outside of New Brunswick, this is a strange new world that I didn't even know about. And I kind of pride myself on being a political observer of the municipal world. Yeah, no, it's, oh. it's true. <laughs> it's true, I know. Okay, I let's just move on from that little aspect for a second. <laughs> um, how do you, we talk about the greater good of a community. We talk about what is in the betterment of the greater good of the community. Now, every single person that you speak to that comes up to talk to you, I'm assuming has what their vision of a greater community is. You as the mayor, as council, have to take all those different opinions and sort of figure out the path forward. For your community, for you, is it hard when in my opinion, and this is just me, and correct me if I'm wrong, most people don't really care about municipal politics as much as they do provincial and federal. When you ask for opinions from people, are they willing to give it to you? Are they willing to actually engage with you on municipal issues to make sure you are giving the greater good to your community? You know, I think that we have pretty good engagement here in the town of Grand Bay Westfield and it's getting better. One of the key values of this council is transparency and to help us um, affect that value in reality. We recently hired the town's first communications manager, which has been very helpful in us pumping as much information out to the community as possible so that they're aware of what we're doing, why we're doing it and how we're doing it. And when you have that kind of information exchange, I think that engenders more engagement from the community. But you know, we're a small town. Um, people, people know me, people know each other. We're a really tight knit community. So people feel very comfortable coming up to me when I'm at the store, when I'm walking the dog, or you know, even online, very accessible through my Facebook page, through the town's Facebook page, website, email, et cetera. Uh, my phone number's out there. People don't have any problem giving me a call and letting me know what's what's going on. So uh, I feel we can always have more engagement. I would love more engagement um, because that helps us determine whether we're going in the right direction for the people that we serve. And that's, that's the heart of everything. We are serving the people. When people do engage, and I and, and I can imagine that they will stop you in the grocery stores because I've spoken to many mayors across this country, and they say they do stop you, especially in small communities. Are they talking to you about municipal issues? Since COVID-19, we have seen a blurring of the jurisdictional lines that people will talk to you. And you're agreeing with me, so I kind of imagine where this answer is already going to go. But will people talk to you about municipal issues or are they bring you a range of issues, provincial issues, healthcare, education? Are they talking about what's going on federally and getting or uh, asking, what are you going to do about federal issues? What are you hearing from the residents? Are they in the realm of the municipal jurisdiction or are they across gambit of all jurisdictions? Well, there's definitely a core municipal issues that people will come and talk to me about, but absolutely no question. There's been a, a distinct blurring of the lines over the last few years, particularly with provincial issues. And, you know, to make that a little bit more complicated, we just uh, are still going through local governance reform here in the province of New Brunswick. And through part of that local governance reform, there has been a downloading of some provincial responsibilities on to um, the municipal governments of the province so so there is a bit of a blurring of the lines and uh you know and and so there is a bit of an education that goes on when i talk to people about you know what what our jurisdiction is and what you know what is federal and, and what is provincial but you know people people want to know what we are doing about certain things and they they really don't want to say for me to say oh, that's provincial or that's federal. They really want me to help them facilitate their way to the answer. 
So sometimes what that looks like, you know, is uh, I will introduce them to the MLA or I'll facilitate them getting the answers or at least a path to the answers that they're looking for. But nobody wants me to say, oh, that's provincial or that's federal and just walk away. Is it more that people are wanting to be heard? Because you are the closest to the people. You don't go off to the Capitol to do your job. You don't go off to Ottawa to do your job. You are in your community and you are the closest to them. And there's probably a better chance that as a councillor or mayor, in your case, mayor, you are more likely to respond to someone because you know them. You probably have worked with them or gone grocery shopping or seen them at the Saturday morning hockey game. How important is it to just listen to people from time to time? Because as the mayor and council, you don't have all the answers. And I'm not trying to burst anyone's bubble who's listening to this right now. <laughs> but you don't have all the answers. And sometimes people just want to be heard. Is that not true? I think that's 100% true. I mean, I certainly feel that way when, when I have an issue that 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 is impacting my life. And I, and I think that's important, you know, for, for me to listen, no matter what their issue is. And also part of my role is to advocate for my residents, you know, if they have an issue, even if it's not something, you know, that's within, you know, my purview in terms of something that I can do about it, I can certainly help advocate for them with the people who can. And that is one of the, that's, that's part of the, the culture of the town that we've been putting forward is that we are here to help and we want to help when we can. Before we turn to the community as a whole, I have one question about the personal life and the public life of a, a mayor in a community like yours. I can imagine there's days you just want to be perfect. There's days that you just want to go out, grab a carton of milk and come home and just relax. But you know the moment you leave your house, you are mayor of your community. That means if you get stopped, you're probably going to have to talk to have mm -hmm. you found that balance of being Brittany and being a Mayor Maryfield in your community? You know, that's a tough one. Um, and, and I don't find that particularly, I guess I don't find it particularly difficult because I'm an extrovert to begin with. So I like to talk. So usually that's not, that's not an issue for me. Um, and I, I love people. I love my neighbors. I love my community. So I, I love talking to the people that want to come up and talk with me. Now, on the other hand, I have four children. <laughs> and sometimes they will say, Mom, you're I'm gonna run in and get the milk. <laughs> we want to get home. So 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 there's there there's that. I haven't found that to be particularly onerous. People are really respectful. I've had no one come and be, you know, nasty or mean to be in public at all. Uh, uh I have a great relationship with everyone that uh you know that i that i work with on a municipal level and uh no i you know i guess the balance would be not so much running into people in public but you know turning off the emails at night or not answering the phone you know you know during dinner things like that that would be more of a challenge for me the work life balance but uh i don't mind the public facing bit at all because it's another way for me to interface with the people that i'm serving um you bring up a good question before I turn to the next segment, and it, it's about listening to the residents, talking to the residents, engaging with the residents. Um, how important is it for you to listen to all sides of the equation? Because we we often find ourselves in that that sort of echo chamber. We we only talk to the people who agree with us, who support us, who want to be with us. But as a mayor and council, you have to look at every single issue and you have to ensure that you are hearing both sides of the story. So while you haven't had that many negative interactions, I'm assuming there are people who probably, like we said, disagree with you on stances that you have taken. How important is it to respectfully, and I use that word key here, respectfully listen to all sides of every issue, no matter what the uh, problem is facing your community? Right. And that sort of goes back to that whole not walk, walking, walking into a council meeting, being as unbiased as possible, because, you know, if you don't, if you walk in and think I'm only going to listen to side A and not side B, then you're not unbiased, are you? So we, you know, we take our residents seriously and sometimes it's not pretty for council and administration. You know, we work hard to be prepared and have all the relevant information. Um, and, but then sometimes we'll have people come in to speak as a delegation and then we develop a new understanding of maybe the neighborhood or the issue at hand. And, and that does cause us to 
change our approach and direction. I think it's an important quality for an elected official is that ability to learn new things and be open to learning that new thing, you know, even if it might it might be countered to something you already think you know, but also discern between when to adhere to our decisions and, and then maybe when to change our minds. So um, I think that that's, you know, it's sometimes not easy, like not a lot of what we do here on council is easy, but it is necessary. And, um, you know, and, uh, you know, sometimes, it, like I said, people are very nice to me in person, um, but sometimes on social media, not so much. What? You learn You're saying social media is a cesspool? Come on, man. <laughs> you know, sometimes people are, you know, it's, um, you know, they're, 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 very unvarnished when in, in in the way that they let you know about what you've done. So. Um, we're going to talk about some of the issues of the community in a few seconds here. But before I do that, I'm going to preface this, as I always do on the show, that this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. I usually say at this point in time, the mayor only has one vote, but technically she doesn't unless it's a tie vote. So this is going to be a new adventure for Chris Brown to talk about. Um, so with that being said, this is your opinion. In your opinion, Mayor, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing your community today as of recording this show? Okay. Oh, the, they, I mean, there's quite a few of them. Um, I think the biggest challenge, and we have had a few, is balancing the needed investments to support the growth that we need here in the town. And we, we do need to grow to be sustainable with the realities of today's economic situation like the you know the inflation and the labor shortages that that we're all facing um we have barriers to development including the lack of a water distribution system we're all on wells here and you know we don't have the resources to do that project so when i have a developer come to the town one of the first questions they ask me is what's what's the water situation so you know we have um so it's it's all about resourcing, really. So we have significant challenges during our budget cycles. Uh, again, inflation, as I've mentioned before, um, inadequate provincial funding. Um, we're working on that provincially, like right now. I've always already referenced that download of some provincial services, which have increased our our costs. Uh, we recently brought snow and ice control in house, um, and so that was a big lift for a small town such as ours. And um, again, local governance reform has has been, it's been a challenge for not just my municipality, but other municipalities across the entire province. Okay, so there's a few sandboxes here that I want to play in, if you don't mind. <laughs> and I, <know. laughs> I want to talk about the very first one, because I think it's the most important, and it's the one that I'm hearing a lot about, and that is investments into the community. You talk about inflation, you talk about uh, labor shortages, you talk about the water system. Now, you know, and I know that municipalities do not have an unlimited supply of money unless somehow they get a windfall tomorrow. But let's be honest, that is probably not going to happen. How do you move forward in 2024? Because we're recording this in January of 2024. This episode airs in February. How do you move forward in 2024 when inflation is still supposed to be getting higher or if not level out to a point where it is going to be the way it is until the end of the year the labor shortage is not going to just pick up tomorrow and people are going to start going into areas that they need like construction for housing and water system upgrades means money <laughs> lots of money so how do you as mayor as the head of council navigate the investment into your community, understanding that you cannot do it on the backs of the residents that are currently there because they're already struggling. Yeah, I mean, that's tough. So we, you know, we are largely almost entirely dependent on property tax as our main source of revenue. We have, uh, as I've referenced before, decreased provincial funding transfers. And, you know, we have uh, increased um infrastructure requirements due to the growth that's happening nationwide 
So one of the things that uh, that I'm doing, you know, as as mayor and through our provincial association, the Union of Municipalities of New Brunswick, and also through the federal um, association FCM, is advocating for fiscal reform. So we had the structural reform in New Brunswick here over the last 18 months. Now we need to move into the fiscal reform piece. And that's critical. We can't just rely on property tax revenues to fund everything that we need to fund now. We've got a, an 18th century funding system and we have 21st century issues that we need to resource. So we're not just talking about essential services anymore, like roads and, and water and sewer. We're talking about things like homelessness, mental health, poverty, community development, all of those things that we need to help fund. And we, we can't do it on our own. So fiscal reform is going to be, I think, the number one issue. And that will be something that will be transformational that will need to occur in 2024 to help resource municipalities so that they're vibrant and sustainable and thriving. That's great. And I'm going to say it is needed. The federal government, the provincial governments and territorial governments need to come to the table and actually work out an agreement. Understandable. But we saw in Halifax in 2023, the premiers get together and say, well, the problem, the federal government should be negotiating with municipalities. Blaine Higgs, your premier, said this. I'm going to ask a political question here. So uh, hopefully you're prepared for that on the not political municipal show. Um, <laughs> while you can wait and hope and make those calls, you have to pass a budget. You have to pass a budget that is in the here and now. And in the reality that we are in here and now, you can't ask for more money because they're not going to give it to you. Is it hard to budget in a time when you are expecting so much growth? And I looked at, I watched your State of the Union, State of the City address in 2023, and it seems like you have lots of things on the go. You have lots of projects uh, ongoing in your community, and those all cost money. And with inflation the way it is, that means higher costs. Are you finding that you are having to cut back on certain areas because you still need to see that growth happen in your community. Yeah, you know, it's it's been tough. You know, the, the town of Grand Bay Westfield is extremely fiscally responsible. And, you know, we we run, a, you know, a tight ship. It's a lean operation. Um, and we are experiencing those external and internal financial pressures as we provide those required services to our res residents. So we have to be really strategic about what we invest in and what we don't. And we use our strategic plan as our roadmap for everything. We have four strategic priorities, smart growth, organizational capacity, infrastructure and climate adaptation and community vitality. So everything that we do, uh, you know, is, um, is guided by that roadmap. We'd love to do all kinds of things. Uh, you know, we'd like to invest in hydrology studies. You know, we'd like to put more money into our roads, et cetera. But we do have to make those hard choices because we we have a finite amount of money that we can work with. And if we want to do more, the only way that we can make more money is via property tax. And we have to be really sensitive to the burden on our ratepayers when we do that. So it's 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 tough. It's not easy, and it's uh, it's a delicate balancing act. You, you talk about wanting to do more, and I want to flip the script a little bit because you've given me some pretty big macro issues that the community is facing. But if I go talk to a hundred people in your community, I guarantee it, guarantee it, they will probably address some of these issues. I'm assuming, particularly over the water system, because it just that's shocking. Or, but here we are. Um, they will probably give me some very micro issues that they have uh, that, as their issues. Potholes, park upgrades, service level upgrades because they want to go access the pool or the library longer hours than traditionally. Mm -hmm. How do you balance? And it goes back to that greater good of the balance. But I'm going to use uh, my favorite quote from Star Trek Wrath of Khan because that's how big of a geek I am. How do you balance the needs of the many against the needs of the few? Because People want to feel like their money is being spent on them, not for 20 years from now when they potentially might not be here, but right here and now. How do you balance the growth with the today and here and now residents? 
That is the reality <laughs> of this order of government. And it's frankly one of the reasons I love it. Because, you know, one day I'm 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 you know deal I'm helping out a resident who has a neighbor who has a rooster and neighbor number one works shift work and neighbor number two's rooster is, you know crowing all hours of the day and night so i've got that and then on the other hand i'm dealing with a new municipal framework for growth on a national level that's that's the fascination of the role we have so that comes down to the fact that we can't forget that those those little issues are also you know they can be big issues too and they, they can be bigger than just that one person but we we do want to help every everyone but sometimes we just can't there are things that we can't do, such as, I guess, reroute overland drainage on individual property. But um, there are things that we can do to promote the good of the entire community. And it's, but this is the key, I think. It's important to be able to recognize those individual issues that actually might be representative of the many, which can often be the case. So maybe it's just one person coming to you with that issue, but there may be many with that same issue. So in, in that case, um, discerning which is which can help us make decisions for the greater good of the community. I love that answer. That is the first time I've actually been impressed by that answer. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, it, your job is to, uh, I don't want to say please, but help as many people as you can. These micro issues, those issues that are facing individuals, some of them, like you said, if a, a neighbor A's rooster is uh, barking or cockadoodle doodling for, <laughs> for four hours in the morning, that is going to be something that you could possibly take care of in the short term. But some things do cost money, and some that means that you have to make those tough decisions. Is it hard to say no to people when you know you want the betterment of the community for them or instead of saying no do you tell people unfortunately we can't do it now but we could look at it in the future what is your sort of go-to method to try to make sure people feel like they've been heard but also their issue is not just going to be brushed aside yeah, I know. And and that's that's that where we, we again go back to how important it is for people to feel like they're being legitimately authentically heard. So <clears throat> that's it's tough because people you, you want to be able to help everybody with their individual issues. But it's important to realize, particularly if it costs money, if it's not a more wide ranging issue and, you know, you're spending X number of dollars to fix an individual issue. That means all of your neighbors are paying for your individual issue. And that's not tax fairness. So sometimes, you know, you have to come back to that tax fairness piece and explain it in that regard. And sometimes people will understand that. Sometimes they won't. And they'll just be, you know, upset that you aren't able to help them with that particular issue. But um, people do legitimately know that we are here to help. I truly believe that, um, especially if I'm able to engage with them one on one. Again, often I don't have the answer that they want to hear. Uh, and sometimes I am able to help. But I think if you take the time to explain why we can't do it now, what, or that we can maybe take a look at it in the future, that helps ease the sting of sometimes not getting the answer that you're looking for. You talk about a provincial downloading, uh, about mental health, homelessness. Now, these are issues that are not just municipal. They're not provincial. They're not even just federal. They're entire gambit. All jurisdictional needs need to come to the table to address this. But we often forget about the last part that needs to come to the table. And that's the community itself. People in the community need to buy into the strategies that the municipalities, the provinces put in place to move forward. In Grand Bay, Westfield, do you see that there is buy-in to help people who are struggling right now, whether it be through mental health, whether it be through homelessness initiatives? What do you see on the ground that gives you sort of, sort of hope that you are not just doing this as a, as a council, but you're doing this as a community? Uh, you know, there's... It there's been a real sea change in terms of people's um, reaction 
to this type of issue now, particularly with the homelessness piece. We don't have a lot of it right here in the town of Grand Bay, Westfield, but in our in our regional hub city, the city of St. John, we we see a lot of it. And there, there's a real sense of tragedy that I feel from people. They they want to help. They want to do something about it. And you know, even though we don't see you know the tents etc. as much here in the town of Grand Bay, Westfield, some of the the people that are in the tents are from the area. So we we have a connection, um, and people I think want an all hands on deck approach to solving some of these problems. And that when I say all hands on deck, I mean all three orders of government, all not for profits and NGOs. They want action and they want everybody to take some responsibility for solving the problem because it's such a complex problem. I don't think any one group can solve it anyway, but there definitely is a sense from the community that uh, that we all need to take some responsibility for solving it. I appreciate that. I am conscious of time and I have to ask this question because I've always been accused on the show of only talking about negative things. So I need to ask the positive <laughs> question when it comes to community. What does Grand Bay Westfield get right? What is the thing that when you go to the Union of New Brunswick Municipalities, you boast about? When you go to FCM, when you talk to municipal leaders across Canada, what do you boast about about your community when it comes to what the municipality administration and council do right? Oh, what the town, what we've done right? Yeah. I, that, um, I think... I'm um, I'm most proud of a couple of things. One is our commitment to transparency. We are we have been transparent, so transparent that it hurts. And I'm because like I said, it can be it can be ugly sometimes because you know sometimes you share things that you know people aren't happy about. I'm really really proud of that, and I think we're the gold standard for that. And and to continue that piece. Um, our communications um, have been held up by municipalities all over the province as being the gold standard for communications for a town of our size. People say that we communicate clearly, concisely, cleanly, and often so that people really understand what's going on and what we're doing and what's happening in the community and um, very, very proud of those two things. I appreciate that. And I want to turn to my last segment because I am, like I said, I'm cautious of time and I, you know, you're a busy mayor. So I want to talk about my favorite subject. And as I've promised on the show, if you come on the show, I will come to your community and spend my hard earned economic dollars in your community. I have a few communities in New Brunswick that I'm visiting this year. So Grand Bay Westfield is now on the map of a stop. So hopefully we can grab a coffee. <laughs> But, oh, listen, I will I will take you to all of the places. Awesome. <laughs> lots, lots of wonderful things I can show you here. Well, and that what that leads to the question is, what are the hidden gems of your community that tourists, because I believe municipalities need to promote themselves a little bit better on a Canadian-wide scale as we are Canadian-wide show. What are some of the tourist destinations that people need to stop in and see in Grand Bay, Westfield? Well, let me set the stage for you a little bit, Chris. So we are a beautiful town and we're on the side of the Appalachian Mountains and also along uh, the river's edge. And our river is absolutely spectacular. And we have a cottage country feel to our town. Uh, we're the proud home to five gorgeous stone sculptures commissioned as part of the region's sculpture symposium that was over five or six years. Um, we uh, we have what's called the Municipal Heritage Trail. It stretches the entire length of our community along the shores of the river, which is fabulous for walking, running, cycling. We have Unity Park, which has a beautiful gazebo um, and it's a beautiful natural area. We have a live music summer stage series in the summer and we've started the mayor's uh, holiday tree lighting in the winter time. We have what's called the Brundage Point River Center, which again is, is right on the on the, the St. John or the Woolstoke River. And it's got beautiful views. It's an elegant space that you can use for meetings or celebrations. We have yoga there. There's a public boat launch, um, beautiful grounds. It's right next to the Westfield Ferry. So it's uh, it's a great uh, a great spot to gather. 
again, like I said, cycling or driving through the town is uh, is absolutely gorgeous. And with local governance reform, we took on a little bit more area. So now the Narapis River is within our borders and it oh. is an absolute natural gem uh, where you can kayak, you can fish, you can walk the banks. It's uh, It's absolutely spectacular. Where's your favorite spot? And I'm going to ask you to sort of play Sophie's choice here for a second. But where do you go in your community to decompress? After a long day of council meetings, after a long day of meetings, after a long day of just being mayor of your community, is there a spot in your community? And if it's private, don't worry. You don't have to tell me exactly where. But <laughs> where do you go in your community to just decompress, let it all go? Because you know tomorrow morning you're going to have to do it all again and try to make your community a better place for everyone who lives there. Yeah, well, you know, that's that's an easy answer. So I don't live right on the river, but I live very close to the river and we have public river accesses all along the town. And so um, when it's not winter, uh, I'll take my dogs down to the river and we'll we'll walk along the beach. And uh, so my sister just lives five minute walk away from me. And I always say, well, you know, um, it's it's uh, four minutes, four minutes by road six minutes by beach. So often I will take the dogs down and, uh, you know, visit my sister and, and then walk back. But, you know, if I'm going, you know, if I want a meal or something along those lines, we have a number of choices in the town that are absolutely wonderful to gather with friends or family, et cetera. But, you know, we live in a community surrounded by water. And uh, to me, that is always my go-to when I want to decompress. I appreciate that. It sounds like an outdoor adventure just waiting to happen. And I'm so looking forward to visiting uh, Grand Bay Westfield uh, later on uh, this year. But before I let you go, I have one last question. We started talking about yourself. We're ending by talking about the town. And I asked this question knowing that every municipal politician should be able to answer this question. And that is, in your opinion, what makes Grand Bay Westfield such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? You know, that that's actually a pretty easy answer. Um, first of all, I would say, without question, it's the people. Our the people that live in Grand Bay Westfield are second to none. And you could you can see it. Um, you know, I talked about the floods earlier. Everybody coming together and doing just the hardest, dirtiest job you can imagine, filling sandbags for people that they don't know, have no connection with, and they spent days and days and days doing that. So absolutely, number one, the community, they're always there for somebody. Um, you know, there's something here for everyone. I mean, there's hiking, there's walking, cycling trails, parks, shopping. We have a golf course, a splash pad, pickleball court, skating, dog park, and again, that uh, all-important river access. Um, we have wonderful community groups and organizations, so we have great recreational activities. And, you know, we're a dynamic and vibrant community, and uh, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. Brittany, I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I know I said 40 minutes. We're just past the 40 minute mark here. But I do want to take this moment and say thank you so much for A, getting back to me, saying you want to come, you do so wanted to come on the show, and B, for taking time out of your day and talking about yourself and what I believe is the most important level of government municipalities and also your community of Grand Bay Westfield. Thank you so much for doing this. And thank you so much for serving your community. I don't think municipal politicians hear that enough. And I need we need to start thanking you guys. So thank you so much. Well, thanks, Chris. It was it was a pleasure to get on here and, and meet you and uh and again have a have an opportunity to, you know, to tell, you know, hopefully the rest of the country about what a wonderful place this town really is. Well, I, I'm looking forward to visiting it later on this year and seeing it up close and personal with myself. And hopefully, like I said, we can grab a coffee and get a little dime tour of your community when I'm there. 100%. Thanks so much for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. If today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations on the Cross Border Interviews and to our 
eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch program that you have come to enjoy. Now, if you can, please consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in amplifying the depth and breadth of this programming. Find our support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.